Welcome to the first video on behaviours. This video is going to assume that students are familiar with the definition of Laplace transforms for common signals and also the difference between a transfer function and a Laplace transform. The particular focus of the first video is to consider what information is embedded in Laplace and how much of this can be extracted without doing a formal inverse Laplace procedure. In simple terms, we want to say, just by looking at the Laplace, can we characterize the sorts of behaviors we expect in the underlying signal? Before we start then, we might need to remind ourselves of a typical table of Laplace transforms. Now this is not complete by any means, it's just to indicate the sorts of things you need to be familiar with. So for example, the Laplace of e to the at is 1 over s minus a. The Laplace of e to the minus bt is 1 over s plus b. The Laplace of sine omega t is omega over s squared plus omega squared. The Laplace of e to the minus bt cos omega t is s plus b over s plus b all squared plus omega squared. The Laplace of a step is 1 over s and the Laplace of t e to the at is 1 over s minus a squared. Now there are more and if you're not familiar with these I suggest you get your full table out because we're going to use these in the remainder of this video. Let's focus first on simple poles. So you can see those written on the right hand side. The Laplace of e to the minus at is 1 over s plus a and the Laplace of e to the bt is 1 of s minus b. And the reason we've used this sort of double-sided arrow is to explain that these two are synonymous. What we would expect is if a student sees 1 over s plus a, they immediately think, ah, the underlying signal is e to the minus at. Or if they see a 1 over s minus b, they think the underlying signal is an e to the bt. However, there's one further thing that you should be noticing. What's the link between the pole position and the time domain behavior. Now if we just make it clear, the pole position for this top one is s equals minus a and the pole position for this bottom one is s equals b. So what's the observation? If the pole is in the left half plane then the corresponding exponential is convergent. So a pole s equals minus a, that's in the left half plane, gives an e to the minus a t which is convergent. If the pole is in the right half plane, as you can see, the s minus b gives a pole at s equals plus b, then the corresponding exponential is divergent. And this is quite important. Now, just for completeness, in case anybody hasn't seen this terminology before, we'll just clarify what we mean by left half plane and right half plane. So if I draw an, um, an argon diagram, so there we are, I have a real axis and an imaginary axis, then everything to the right of the imaginary axis, here I've used the red hashes, is the right half plane, is to the right of the imaginary axis. And everything to the left of the imaginary axis, there I've used the left passage, is called the left half plane. Hopefully that's fairly obvious. An illustration then of some simple poles and how the behavior is affected. You'll see we've put poles at minus three, there's minus three, minus 1, plus 1, and plus 3. Now, the 1 and the 3 are in the right half plane, and the minus 3 and the minus 1 are in the left half plane. And what we want to look at is how do these different pole positions affect the behavior? First example, then, you'll see I've put the pole at minus 3, and I've given the corresponding um, step response that you get from this, and you'll notice that the exponential converges fairly quickly. You'll notice by two seconds, and there's two seconds here, the exponential's pretty much converged to its steady state value. So that's with a pole. Sorry, I don't know where that went. That's with a pole at minus three. What happens then if I move the pole to minus one? Now you can see that the time it takes to converge is a bit slower. Oops, sorry, I don't know why that's disappearing. It's a bit slower. You'll see it's taken five seconds, something like five seconds, before it converges 
to the steady state value. So the pole at minus 1 is slower than the pole at minus 3. So if I put here slow and fast, you can see the point. What next? Let's try one of these uh, pole positions that gives a divergent exponential. So there you can see e to the t, or 1 over s minus 1, so the pole is at a plus 1. And what do you notice now? The signal is diverging, as expected. And here we've plotted the signal up to about 3 seconds, and you can see it's getting to a magnitude of 50 to the 60 in 3 seconds. What happens if I move the pole to plus 3? And here you'll notice it's diverging much more quickly. OK, so what we have again, if I put it over here, is slow divergence and quick divergence. So as the pole moves to the right, the divergence gets quicker. And if you're in the left half plane, as the pole moves to the left, the convergence gets quicker. So what summary have we got? Poles in the left half plane are associated to convergent behaviour that gets faster the further to the left and slower the closer to the origin. So what we've got, if I do a, a plot here so you can see, if I have a pole here, then I might have an exponential that goes like that. If I have a pole here, then I'll have an exponential that goes like that. So as I go further to the left, the convergence gets faster. What happens if the pole is in the right half plane over here? Now, if I have the pole fairly close to the imaginary axis, yes, it explodes and it does it at a reasonable rate. If I move the pole further to the right, further into the unstable, then it explodes much more quickly. OK? So in summary, poles in the right half plane are associated to divergent behaviour and it diverges faster as poles move to the right. Poles in the left half plane are associated to stable or convergent behaviour and they converge faster as the pole moves to the left. Now, a denominator factor of the form s plus a, you'll see I've highlighted that in red here, is associated with a left half plane pole and hence convergent behaviour. The denominator factor of the form s minus a is associated with divergent behaviour and a right half plane pole. And hopefully that's clear. One's got the plus, which gives you a pole in the left half plane. One's got the minus, gives you a pole in the right half plane. So a quick question, just to make sure we're awake. Which of the following are stable and which are unstable? Well, for the stable ones, I'm looking for forms s plus a, which gives me poles in the left half plane, and therefore I can see it's this one, this one, and this one. They've all got s plus, and therefore they all give me convergent exponentials. Clearly the unstable ones have got the minuses, that's that one, and that one. And part of the reason for this example is to illustrate the magnitude of a and b are incidental. They have no impact on stability or convergence, divergence. What they change is the speed at which that happens. The most important thing, if you're distinguishing stability and instability, is the sign. What about more general signals? What makes other signals diverge or converge? Well, first, we'll ignore sinusoids because we know they neither diverge nor converge. They oscillate forever. There is a special case if you look at things like ramps, which do occur, occur sometimes. Um, a ramp has a form 1 over s squared, which is a double pole at 0. So it's on the border between the left half plane and the right half plane. But strictly speaking, a ramp is divergent. You can see that. Um, so if you see over a 1 over s squared, you're thinking ramp divergence. But we're not going to dwell on such subtleties here. A step has a transform 1 over s, which has a single pole at the origin. And that one gives you a constant and therefore will be considered as a convergent signal. And you'll notice the sort of confusion here. A double pole at the origin, divergent. A single pole at the origin, convergent. So the origin is a special case. The question we now need to ask, though, is what's the distinguishing characteristic as to whether 
a signal is convergent or not. Because we've seen that sinusoids don't converge, we've seen a ramp or a pole at the origin um, does um, diverge, a single pole at the origin, and it converges. So we're asking ourselves, well, we've got all these signals and we don't seem to have a pattern. So what pattern have we got that tells us whether a signal will converge or not? And the simple answer is, if it's modulated by an exponential, then the exponential dominates. Here we go then. So here's some typical signals. e to the minus bt cos omega t, t e to the at, e to the at sin omega t, and t e to the minus bt. Which of these signals converge and which of them diverge? And you'll notice the cosine and the sine on their own don't converge or diverge, they oscillate forever. A t on its own diverges. But what happens when I've modulated all these signals by an exponential? Let's have a look at the plot and then we'll discuss the answer. The first one, e to the minus bt cos omega t, I'm multiplying something, uh, the cos, which is always up to plus and minus one, by another signal, e to the minus bt, which is converging to zero. So clearly the result will converge to zero. And that's this blue curve here. You can see it oscillates a bit at first, but as the exponential gets smaller and smaller, so does the consequent signal. <coughs> what about t e to the at? So we've got a ramp, t, which is divergent, multiplied by an e to the at, which is divergent. That won't surprise you, therefore. That's this sort of magenta curve here. It's divergent. If you multiply two divergent signals, you're going to get a divergent signal. What about the next one? e to the at sine omega t. So what I'm doing now is I'm multiplying a sinusoid, which oscillates forever, by an exponential, which is divergent. And unsurprisingly, what you'll see is you'll get a, a growing um, sinusoid. And that's this green curve. Can you see how the magnitude gets gradually larger and larger and larger? And therefore, that is divergent. And finally, we've got t e to the minus bt. Now, this is the peculiar one, because you're multiplying t, which diverges, by e to the minus bt, which converges. And you might say, well, one of them's going to dominate. Is it the t, or is it the e to the minus bt? And there's a basic rule in mathematics which says that the exponential will always dominate in the end even if not initially. And so if you look at this red curve here, this one is the t e to the minus bt. And you'll see it converges. Okay, So if you multiply a t by any exponential, where the exponential is convergent, eventually that signal will converge to zero. So what's the pattern that we're noticing here? If there's a convergent exponential multiplied by any signal, course, the whole signal converges. If there's a divergent exponential multiplied on the signal, then that signal diverges. So any signal multiplied, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen, sorry about that, multiplied by convergent exponential converges. Any signal multiplied by a divergent exponential diverges. So how do we identify the presence of a divergent exponential? Well, we've done this already with simple poles, but let's just do it for completeness. If we look at this signal here, e to the minus bt cos omega t, you can see we've got a convergent exponential. If we look at the corresponding Laplace transform, you notice in the denominator it's got this term s plus b squared. And in the simple poles, we said if you have an S plus, it tends to indicate a convergent exponential. So that's what we're seeing here. The e to the minus bt has given rise to this term S plus b, all squared. If I go to the bottom one, down here, where you've got t e to the minus bt, again, you can see in the denominator, I've got an S plus b, all squared. And so the key indicator is, if I've got S plus terms in the denominator, then I'm likely to be stable or convergent. Now conversely, if I look at the other two signals, the ones modulated by divergent exponentials, what do you notice in the denominator? I have these s minus a terms, and therefore indicates 
divergent exponential. So there's simple pattern recognition. Look at the transform. Are there s plus terms or s minus terms? Now, it's not quite enough, but we'll complete this picture on the next slide. Let's look at the pole positions for each transform, because it's the pole positions that really give us the answer. Let's look at the first example. So my denominator is s plus b or squared plus omega squared, and that's got poles minus b plus and minus j omega. So you'll notice the real part of the pole is minus, minus b. If I look at the next example, 1 over s minus a squared, the pole, in fact there's two poles at a, so I can put a comma a if you want to be complete, both are plus a. If I look at the next example, where I've got s minus a squared plus omega squared, you can see the poles are at a plus and minus j omega, and the key thing is again the real part is plus a. For the final example, I've got s plus b squared, and you'll see the pole is at minus b, and again I've got a double pole um, at minus b. So what's the pattern that you've noticed here? And I'll put it up here. Minus b plus or minus j omega is in the left half plane. Minus b is in the left half plane. So the signals which have convergent behavior have poles in the left half plane. And obviously, you can see the signals which have divergent behavior have poles in the right half plane. So finally, we're beginning to get to some form of summary. So an argon diagram. Let's put some poles in and see what sort of behavior we get. So if I put a pole here, then the corresponding behavior, simple exponential, converges. If I put a pole here, simple exponential converges faster. What happens if I put a pole up here? Still in the left half plane, but now it's got a complex bit. Then what you're going to see is this sort of behavior. You're going to get a convergent oscillation, something like that. What happens if I put the pole over here? So clearly that's got a, a real component which is further into the left. Well, you'll still get the oscillation, but now it will converge much more quickly. OK? So if you're in the left half plane, the sort of behavior you get is convergent. If you have an imaginary part in the pole, then you'll get some oscillation. Now let's move over to the right half plane. If we have a pole here, what do we get? We get divergent behavior. If we have a pole here, what do we get? Faster. <coughs> divergent behavior. If we make the pole complex, <coughs> so it's a plus j omega, then what you're going to get is a divergent sinusoid. If you move the pole over here, so the real part is even bigger, then I'm going to struggle to draw this, but your sinusoid basically diverges much more quickly. And so in summary, if you've got poles in the left half plane, you have stable, convergent behavior. If you have poles in the right half plane, you have unstable or divergent behavior. And there's the summary again. If a transform has poles in the right half plane, the associated signal is divergent or unstable. If all the poles are in the left half plane, the signals are convergent or stable. Poles on the imaginary axis give rise to signals that neither converge or diverge. That is sinusoids, with obviously ignoring the double pole on the origin as a special case. The further a pole is from the imaginary axis, the faster the behavior, either the speed of convergence or divergence.